they ran five different ones, but two of them actually came up the best. Reciprocity and then Anchoring, right? The Anchoring oh. one was the one that was really interesting, though, because this one was built to kind of wrap around the phrase of a deal so good you can only buy four of them. And this I love because I don't think a lot of people know how to use Anchoring well. They think that Anchoring is anchoring to one specific price. Like, it used to be $10, now it's $5. That's one style of Anchoring. All right, folks, welcome back to your favorite DTC podcast. I know we've been gone for a while. I've been on a little bit of a European vision quest. Ash has been over there building the Avi Empire. The new rebrand stuff looks fire, by the way. That that watermelon is, is gorgeous. Um, I'm still salty. I, he still hasn't reconciled the uh, peanut butter bar kerfuffle but hey but hey you. oh my it god is, it is what it is and I, I i know where i stand in the in the ash moani hierarchy but hey you know what do you got to do what do you got to <laughs> not again not again <laughs> um speaking of psychological titillations and amazingness we brought the queen sarah levenger on sarah and i you've actually been on roas we've had a, a lot you spoke spoke at the whaley's that's our actually most uh requested uh talk um, was Is your Whaley's really? talk? Yeah, I get hit up almost every Woo. other week for that um, talk, uh, which I was featured in as well with my uh, sneaker obsession. But so we're going to dive deep into um, why you should be thinking about psychology, especially the psychological levers in terms of not only your marketing, your ads, but it should proliferate throughout your whole brand. But before we get into that stuff, I want to talk a few things first, some just uh, latest new stuff. Have you guys seen... Uh, or I guess we'll start with you, Sarah, and then we'll go to you, Ash. What's your rating on the uh, the Barbie movie rollout? How how do you think their marketing team has done? I'm super crazy excited for this movie, which is funny because I never played with Barbies as a kid. That was not my thing. I grew up on yeah. a block with like eight boys, so we were always playing with like Pokemon and G.I. Joe and like all kinds yeah. of stuff. I had two Barbies, and that's all I remember about it was I just had them. I don't know. I wasn't like super into the life, but like some women were like Bar- Barbie, you know what I'm saying? So they have the car and they have the dream house and they have all the stuff. And it's quite interesting because Barbie has been around for generations yeah. and they just keep like lifting it. Like, I don't know. The team at Barbie must just be bought on because they can bring back Barbie every single generation. doesn't matter who you are, what age you are. You can just bring it back. <laughs> it works. The, the campaign for this particular one, though, is like crazy. I saw something from Dara that was. Some stat that they had gotten over a hundred different like partnerships. The collabs just, are incredible. Just, like collab just to get like they have rolled out. And I am shocked that they were able to do it in such a short amount of time. Because movie premieres are short. I mean, it's like yeah. the span of 18 months to two years, sometimes longer if you're like avatar level. But this was quick. I mean, Barbie really only get it I if I remember correctly, they only started promoting early last year sometime as the earliest I remember them promoting it. I mean, it, it hasn't been around a long time. So they've been rushing it and that team did some serious strategy before they got into this so yeah i mean i'm like i'm all about it i'm gonna go see it opening yeah i i i I agree that that one of my favorites is the airbnb they they actually made a barbie house that you could like stay in like an actual uh, barbie (laughs) so good it's so it it, it's well you actually just tweeted something about this about how um there's such a power in the zeitgeist and a lot of marketers think that they can move needles and it's almost like yeah. a salmon salmon swimming up water where it's like if you can actually swim through the zeitgeist and latch onto this cultural phenomenon um that's i mean because you're also seeing that with brand like non-endorsed collabs where all like it's incredible i mean ruggable actually just did a collab with barbie it's it's been insane um ash you and i are probably not the target market for barbie Um, But I've just been inundated with how impressive. I mean, if there's anything, I mean, I, I, I don't know how to label it anything other than an omnipresent campaign. I mean, it is absolutely everywhere. So before I uh, turned over to you in Austin, there's a really famous mural right on South Congress um, that I love you so much. I don't know if you guys are familiar, but it's, it's really, uh, it's very cliche Austin, but Austin, Austin's just a cool city like that. And it's just essentially this graffiti that's on the side of a, a really famous coffee shop here called Joe's just says, I love you so much. And they actually co-opted that where they put Barbie, uh, Barbie at the top comma, I love you so much, uh, dash Ken. And so like, it's, it's totally taken over the city. It's crazy. It's, it's, uh, I'm not into it cause you know, you're defeat, you're defacing my town, but, uh, it's right. awesome. It's it is it. very cool. Um, Ash, how would you rate it? What do you think about it? How do you like it? 
I think I think the goal for the brand was to really get it out of, I guess, like the aisles of the toy stores, right? Yeah. So it's not just another Barbie movie where it's like a kid, very focused. It's like, how do you get everybody? I think I think Mattel said this, like, how do you get everybody to play with Barbie in a sense that it's not just a doll, right? And yeah. so it's like, how do you do the Airbnb collab? How do you do the Gap collab? How do you do... And I think there's a hot topic, this and that, right? Yeah. So it's like, how do you get into every single demographic knowing that you have that affinity towards Barbie at some point in, in your life and then yeah. like kind of bringing you back that nostalgia? And so, I mean, we, I, again, I'm not, I'm not comparing Avi to Barbie at all, but like the way that we introduced fun to collagen was to bring and tug at that nostalgia with the fruity cereal flavors, the the cinna cereal, like that Saturday morning sitting and watching cartoons and it was like oh this is fun now so i think that what they're trying to do and what i think they did a great job at is bringing it to where everybody is and not yeah. just like i said in the toy aisles it goes yeah. to show you though too how deep these cultural trends go into the individual people that we are especially in the u.s because for some reason when you get into these like toys or nostalgic things that had to do with our childhood with barbie especially it goes deeper than just the toy itself. Like you could see Barbie pink and know that's a different pink than like T-Mobile pink, right? right? Totally different pink. And you would be able to recognize the difference. And this is where familiarity comes in, especially for branding. Once you get to a point where you have basically just like a global brand and you've been able to take it past this just one person at a time type of stuff, then you get into a totally new part of branding. You're at a kind of a new level, new step where you're starting to integrate it into people's lifestyle and it becomes a part of their identity, which is what Barbie has done. So they've been able to make it global, which is bonkers. <laughs> Props to Barbie. Couldn't agree with you guys more. And I think one of the interesting things, and you alluded to this earlier, Sarah, is um, it's one of those brands that's multi-generational. Yeah. Where it's like the parents get it, the kids get it, like everybody, the grandma gets it, like everybody gets everybody. it because it's just been this pervasive piece of american culture for so long and um yeah i mean it i grew up with like the he-man stuff that was like my thing and like there's no way you could do a he-man kind of thing like this i i i'm trying to think of something that has been i mean this pervasive which is kind of interesting because there is also on the other end and and we'll get past cinema but i just i just find it so interesting in terms of the brand um is the oppenheimer and they've actually yeah. sold out. I, yeah. I, I, I can't wait. Are, are you guys going to go see in the IMAX or are you just going to slum it at a movie? Yeah. yeah you got to go to the, you have to go to the big boy, right? I, but there was, I, there was I, a specific IMAX that you have I to go to. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I watched I, I the don't TikTok where to find it. it, but I got to find it. I'll send you the I, link. I watched this whole TikTok yeah. on the, the, they were going through that and there was like this theater finder and you have to, I guess he shot it on a very specific film. And so yeah. if you want like the yeah. true experience and uh, yeah, I'm totally with you. Ash. I want the but true experience. I want it. I have to, I have to, right? Uh, but it's it's interesting because, you know, not to go too dark, but that was also a massive cultural event, you know, in the world with um, the, the nuclear bomb and things of that nature. And so uh, they've sold as many tickets as um, the Barbie, um, which is really fascinating. And pretty much all the promotion there has been um, Cillian Murphy, like selfie shot or like screen grabs of Cillian Murphy just looking uh, for people that don't know. Cillian Murphy is the um, uh, protagonist who's playing um, Oppenheimer in the uh, Oppenheimer movie. But. Um, yeah. And then uh, I guess one last thing to round out. I think you've really made it when you get Google Easter eggs. Um, so if you do go and try and Google Barbie right now, you'll see this. It'll not only uh, pop up this really fun pink kind of confetti style thing, but it'll also um, tint it in Barbie pink. So I think that was uh, something that was really interesting. Uh, one, what else? One thing there, right, is yeah, do yeah. you guys feel that the amount of marketing that went into Barbie did have a halo effect on Oppenheimer just purely based on the fact they were launching on the same weekend. Ooh, interesting. Go first, Sarah, and then I'll give you my thoughts. <laughs> well, you guys say I'm already nodding. This is the interesting part about the movie industry, and they've they've gotten this down to a freaking science. The movies that you couple with, like the movies that you actually get um, premiered with, with on the same weekend or similar weekends, right, similar month, basically, will drastically change how well your movie does because people could compare it to the two. They did this with Avatar. They did it with a couple of other big ones. Um, Inception was the one that I can remember the most. That they coupled it with specific movies during that time period so that they can actually just boost like rankings of both. 
Barbie and Oppenheimer, I think it was on purpose because really movie blockbusters are difficult to launch, especially in the past couple of years when streaming is such a big thing and yep. it's hurt the movie industry quite a lot. Uh, yeah, hundred percent. Yes, I think they did that on purpose. Um, and I, anybody in the movie industry, let us know. Yeah, yeah. I feel that this is a thing. We're throwing uh, just thoughts from the cheap seats. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And I think one of the interesting parts about it is the economics work. For Barbie, because for people that don't know, most of the money, like Barbie's probably going to do a, a crap ton of money in the actual box office, but the real money's made in franchising, licensing, and merchandising. So the Barbie toys, and you're just going to see a massive uplift in all that. And so even though the marketing spend for this was probably just, just absolutely preposterous in terms of what they spent, I actually think it's going to be a net net win for uh, yeah. Barbie, the Barbie brand in general. Um, so yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you guys more. I think it's... Uh, it's interesting because it was also I, I can't remember uh, when it, but uh, do you guys remember the Prestige and um, what was it, The Illusionist? Or there were there was yeah. they're almost like the same two movies, but they're, they're yeah. like same same but different. They're really good. They're both actually very incredible movies, but they also they kind of flopped at the box office because there was that almost choice paralysis of like which yeah. one do you go see because they're so similar. They're so similar, um, yeah. And this case, this is uh, <laughs> you're talking about a crazy Christopher Nolan flick and then a fun fun barbie flick so it's interesting um i guess the last one i'll give you guys are you guys interested in the ridley scott napoleon have you seen that yet the the premiere for that so he's doing a whole um bi- biopic on uh, napoleon which i'm very very that stoked would be on fascinating isn't Joaquin it sad, phoenix, though, that, like Joaquin nobody phoenix knows is... that's even coming <laughs> oh i get well, we're yeah. so like barbie opera where everybody's like what's that's, that well, it, to be even... fair it's not it's like q4 so it, oh, okay. it to be fair it's not, oh, okay, it's okay, not okay. like in the gotcha. yeah it's they haven't started yeah you would not want to be guy. You don't want to be the other girl of the dance um, with these two coming in. I mean, it is the equivalent Nobody of like Bar- Barbie and Ken walking in. Like you don't, you don't want to be the other. They are the prom king and queen for sure. Um, let's switch things up a little bit. So you have been on the Bird app for a little bit now, grinding, putting out incredible content, and then Colonel Sanders threw you a bone. See what it did there, Ash? I still got it. I still got it. Um, Talk to us about your your, your famous KFC tweet now. Oh it absolutely went gosh. viral. It was amazing. And I think actually Ash was one of the first comments where he said, I was here before it went viral. Um, so he's he's an OG on there. But talk us through kind of that, because I think not only the structure of the tweet, which was amazing, but just the actual value that you got from the tweet. I thought you, you did such a good job of modularizing that value into, uh, you know, no pun intended, but bite-sized uh, digestible pieces. Yeah. Yeah, that one was pure accident as usual with any sort of viral content. It's always right. Anybody that tells you that they can just get you viral content, don't believe them because viral, like true viral content happens at a very particular time for a particular reason. So I took two weeks off at the beginning of June on purpose. Um, I was coming out of no commerce. They grew so much faster than, they're still growing like exponentially faster than anything. So I came out of that ecosystem and was like, I think I need like a mental minute because I'm just like, Right, because I've been producing content four posts a day, five days a week for three years. So it was just like, go, go, go. I mean, yeah. thousands of pieces of content. So I was like, I'm tired. So I took two weeks off the beginning of June just to like rest. And it was fantastic. Dopamine fast, like went pure off of everything. During that time period, though, it was very strange because I kept having all of these ideas for like, that would be a good piece yeah. of content. So I wasn't really rested. I was just pretending you were came back and randomly was like, this is a really interesting post uh, that came off of one of Ogilvy's kind of like case study sites. They have a site called Inside BE. You have to pay for their case study, which I do because I'm obsessed. Um, But to get into like the deeper stuff to understand the like behavior science strategy that they're doing, they had one post that was a paid post for KFC. And I was like, fascinating, like interesting. So I just wrote up my own kind of summary of it. Posted it thinking, like, who knows if this will do. It's KFC. It's not D to C worthy like level so maybe people won't even like this i went to sleep and it was at like fifty thousand people had seen it and i was like sweet this might be my very first like hundred thousand view and then i woke up the next day and it was like eight hundred thousand people had seen this but i was like oh okay this is whoa this is way different than i thought it was gonna be so i watched over the next 48 hours and i ended up getting a million views off of that one post in 48 hours and I got over 2,000 new followers from that one wow. post. And I got 567 
new email subscribers. Wow. Um, and just like t- DMs all over. Like it was just, it was a lot to make. Because it's just me. Like I, I don't even have a VA. It's just Sarah over here. So I'm like, cool. I don't know how I want to manage it. And it was so surreal. I had lots of people commenting. I actually got contacted by the global head of behavior research at Ogilvy. And Let's was like, oh, like, we loved your post. Like, do you want to chat sometime? I'm like, yeah, I do. Um, it was bonkers. Like, it was just so strange because I never really had a viral post. I've had good posts where it's like, you know, 10, 20, 30,000 people. Never a million. That was like, whoa. So, yeah. Oh, it's the beginning of it. <laughs> Definitely a badge of honor. For people that aren't in that million, can you kind of break down what the post was about? Yes. So this post started with uh, basically just the idea of how KFC and the Australian market was trying to get increase their sales. So they had done this one campaign for like, I don't know, probably four or five years where they ran like dollar, you know, sales on French fries in particular. Um, they had done it for a couple of years. So I think the, the consumer base was getting used to it. They just couldn't like yeah. get it to boost anymore. So they were trying to increase. What should we do? They went over to Ogilvy and Ogilvy was like, well, we, I mean, your, your product is not the problem, right? Like, and we can't increase the price. We can't change the product itself. We also can't change the date of this run because KFC wanted to run at the same exact time. So they came in and said, we need to do something like your science. We need to use some psychology in here. And we need to increase the actual intellectual value, right? of the product itself without changing any of the offer, which is highly difficult to do. Yeah. So they went in and they drafted 90 different ways to say $1 fry, which is hard. You got to have a good copywriter for that. Went in, went to all these different ways to say it, and then chose the ones that were specifically psychology based around value. So there's a bunch of different mental heuristics, so mental shortcuts, uh, that pertain just to price or just to value of a product. And they chose five of them and then ran them into Facebook campaigns that were just optimized for clicks, not even conversions, just clicks. Love that. And the reason they did that is because they wanted to test and see which one of these, you know, $1 ads, $1 French fry ads, are, is going to be the best for getting attention, not necessarily getting conversions. Because they already knew on the back end, people are going to buy French fries no matter what happens. We need to get a lot of people <laughs> to buy French fries. So, excuse me. so I went and ran these. The one that popped up that was the best that was uh, specifically attuned to like um, they ran five different ones, but two of them actually came up the best. Reciprocity. Thank you for reminding me. Jeez. Reciprocity and then angry. Right. The no. angry one was the one that was really interesting, though, because this one was built to kind of wrap around the phrase of a deal so good you can only buy four of them. And this. I love because I don't think a lot of people know how to use anchoring well. They think that anchoring is anchoring to one specific price. Like it used to be $10. Now it's $5. That's one style of anchoring. But there's like millions of different ways that you can anchor to things. So this anchoring was more about anchoring how many you could buy, not necessarily what the price was. And by doing this, they basically made it scarce without making it scarce. It was like the strangest psychology backwards way of doing it. But it, it it worked incredibly well. So after they ran this campaign, the campaign itself did fairly well. But what they noticed was over the course of the next summer, they got a 56%, 56% increase in sales based upon the fact that people thought they could only buy four. So they would go to KFC and they would buy like four and then they'd come around in the drive through again and buy four more and they'd come in there on the drive through again, buy four more. So like people were basically just using it as a game. And it was all based on this random psychology of you just told them what they couldn't have. So they were like, challenge accepted. Fascinating stuff. I can't, oh, I can't even enough of it. Yeah. It's crazy. It's so, I mean, it's a, artificial scarcity is something that I think is, I mean, so for me in the sneaker world, that's exactly what happens as well, where um, all, because sneakers are just intrinsically like, or extrinsically, excuse me, just not that. There's there's no real value to them. All all the s- sneaker value is essentially intrinsic, where it's this artificial scarcity, and you're going to drop these limited drops, or they these these sneakers are incredibly hard to find, and so you got to know a guy or gal or whatever to get you hooked up. So I absolutely love that. The Ash, have you guys done anything? Well, you do limited drops sometimes, right? In terms of the artificial scarcity, tell us something it's about some of those. I mean, uh, <laughs> cough peanut bars, cough, but whatever. Yeah. I mean, that's where we've kind of improved retention quite a bit. 
because yep. we have been known to sell out quickly, right? I think during COVID, the first couple of times were unintentional because we were genuinely like just starting. Like we didn't, we couldn't order a ton of product at one time, but we would sell out quickly, right? And so when we when we would launch a product, it'd sell, it'd sell out like in a couple of days and then we'd bring it back and then that relaunch would do even better. And we're like, okay, this again, unintentionally found this out just as supply and cash flow restraints. How do we now apply this to the rest of our marketing and recreate or recreate this artificial phenomenon that's happening, right? So every time we did a, a flavor expansion, we could go and get five to 10,000 units and then probably sell through, or we can get a thousand and really push the community to understand like, hey, if something's considered limited time offer, it is limited time offer or it's a limited edition flavor. So I think that's where when we had like, I think it was in 21 where we had 20 or 26 launches that year. Every launch was just a thousand unit run and each one just kept getting better and selling out quicker just because we actually were doing what we were saying, which was limited edition. This is going to run out quickly. And so instead of, and, and there were times where like we, there were certain flavors that didn't hit as well. But we still stuck true to it where we would like artificially stock it out and yep. then bring it back maybe a couple of weeks later saying like, hey, like this did really well. Uh, we have a few more units and then it would sell out again. Right. So like it's interesting to see like even the flavors that didn't do well just because people thought it did well <laughs> ended up selling more too. Right. So it's just it's crazy to think that way. And it, it's like, yeah, how do you use like this phenomenon in everyday marketing but it's tough when you're not really like launching new products so i guess question for you sarah is for for especially now right we're like we're coming down on the launches this and that really refining how can how can brands still recreate this and even maybe even using the example from the kfc but like how can yeah. brands recreate this on their on their funnels right now yeah i was gonna ask you guys if you have ever tried the um limit two or limit three i was just thinking that like yeah. as you were saying you've it, ever is, tried it. yeah yeah on those launches itself we said limited to like three per person or whatever it was right yeah Love and that. like you would have people in the community be like how did this person get five like <laughs> it was limited to three and we'd be like we're really sorry they like it somehow got through and you know like people would be we upset are, are, are. The, in that moment i always tell brand give them an out right so if they get upset and they're like how did they get five i wanted five we never ever say like oh i don't know it was just a fork we always oh, say oh yeah. here's how they did it they made another email address and then they went and purchased more so go make another email address always give customers a way to purchase more mostly because you don't want it to seem like well we just like you it's just like they, oh we have a we have a hack for this yeah exactly like well our manufacturer only does it this way like you know our shipping only does it this way but we have a, a workaround for you. So, or they bought on the website and then they went on the yeah. app and they bought. Oh, and then they bought in two different shout directions. Out Tapper. Right? Because what Tapper, you're trying too. to make it seem like psychologically is that the brand is here for me and we're both against their shipping fulfillment, <laughs> which is ridiculous, <laughs> right? Like yeah. the brand hiring yeah. the shipping. But the customers really want to feel like somebody's here for me and she got five. I wanted five. Where did yeah. I get five? So, in this, I would love to see Avi try some, hey, not even a new flavor relaunch with a different uh title basically yeah. on any yeah. sort of render that you have and just say hey guys we have this coming out like it's super big everybody's gonna want it but because it's so big and we know it did well last time we're gonna limit it to just three this time well we have our we're launching a new um product next friday so maybe we can do that in the sense like hey we're testing limited to two per person yeah. And we'll see how that, that goes. Yeah. Always, um, always, always start with that deal so good as well, right? Like this yeah. is a deal, the steal. It's got to be super popular. So we've yeah. limited it to just three. Yeah. Um, and see what people do. It's always interesting to watch the behavior of how people work around it. Yeah. Because if they start to work around it, then you know that like, okay, this works. <laughs> no, clearly... I mean, even Rabba's <laughs> example, right? Like with sneakers, like I used to create so many different emails just to 100%. like be able to get it, right? But I yeah. think Nike was smart about it and they actually did cancel orders if you didn't. So like 
they're enforcing it and it that encourages it a little bit more whereas yeah. like we're not we're not gonna like enforce it as yeah. much well you've already gamified it right so if they're enforcing it by shutting people down now people are like how can i get this right so you get to like almost black market level of shoe yeah yeah, where yeah. it gets people are yeah. gonna get it no matter what right they're gonna try their hardest to figure that out <laughs> and that just creates more demand the harder it is to get something the bigger the demand is gonna be i wonder how you can do this on like at least for like, say like on meta, right? Like if you're running a funnel and you have your your main offer, your evergreen offer, like is at, and I'm going to test this and maybe even tweet this out, like the, the results from this, but like literally just having in the buy box, like limited to new customers only, right? So it's like, or like limit to one per customer, whatever it is, one offer per customer and see what that actual bump is. Yeah. To see like even that one line of text does that improve conversion rate by 10%? Does it increase it by 20%? Whatever it is. I want to get to the bottom of this. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll tweet out the test, results. Test it and let us know. Cause like, just, yeah. I, and it's fascinating because you don't need a whole lot of text, right? You don't need a whole lot of incentive to push people to buy. These days, I feel like a lot of brands are working so hard to get people past the purchase point when we don't, we don't really need to push that. I mean, especially if you have good product, good brand. You... Even just one line of text of just it's limited to this many for this many people, it, that in itself could drastically change how your ad performs for sure. I love that. Uh, that's yeah, that's super fascinating. I mean, the I think the king or queen, who, who however you want to say it, uh, of this is McDonald's, right? Like the McRib, they could have the McRib all year, and the McRib yep. is like it, it's a rabid fan base. They just absolutely slayed yeah. the Grimace Shake. Uh, the Grimma Shake was just an absolute. I mean, the, some of the TikToks were a little unhinged, but uh, it, it was Which is so. Funny, cause uh, it was it was an awful product. It, it was, was terrible. terrible. Like it was meant to be disgusting, and it crushed. It crushed. just oh, there's so much psychology in these big brands. I mean, granted, they're working with giant behavior science entities, <laughs> which would be amazing for you to think. But yeah, they they do so well nowadays with weird things. Yeah, well, the other thing they do really well is you have this massive built-in petri dish, right? Like yes. everybody's already ready to play. Like there is, there, yeah, there's a challenge of when you don't. I think there's like stages of that brand, right? And that's where I think this plays well, but it can't be the core. Like I've still haven't gotten on board with like a pure drop model. Like for example, I love Last Crumb. Last Crumb's still one of my brand muses, but I just find it so challenging because now I'm kind of burnt out from that like limited edition. Oh, I can only get this drop. I can only get that drop. Like, and so I think it's a really interesting tactic. But there's yeah. a certain aspect of like, dude, I just want to give you money. Let me get the product. <laughs> and like having you limited noticed, edition though. stuff is amazing. Yeah. But like there, there's a certain aspect of like. You get burnt, or I, that personally, I get burnt out of trying to hawk down cookies constantly, right? Like yeah. even, even with sneakers, like I, I don't even go on sneakers app anymore because I always take the loss. So I'll just actually pay the inflated price on StockX, give somebody else some more money, <laughs> just so I can have the. Rob, are you telling me you don't have a plug yet? <laughs> I tried to. I had it. You said you. I think it was you. Somebody was gonna connect me with a bot guy, but then it ended up falling through. But there is a s certain aspect of like consistency that like when I'm ready to consume, I just kind of want to consume. So yeah, I think there's yeah. there's a certain aspect of this stuff is a really, really fun, but I don't know if it keeps the lights on, right? Like it, it's, yeah. it's this really fun thing, but then there needs to be some sort of value capture mechanism that can live in perpetuity. Right? Those are a lot of fancy words. Sorry. <laughs> some of this comes down to seasonality and 100%. DC brands hate talking about that because they're like, I hate seasonal brand. It's not good for revenue. It's not good for cash flow. I'm not talking about seasonality for like business model. I'm talking seasonality for specific launches of offers, right? Starbucks does this extremely well. You can't oh, yeah. get a PSL outside of PSL season, right? That's when it comes. So get ready. For the kids that don't know, that's pumpkin spice latte and you don't want Pretty it. You don't want it. I hate it. I hate <laughs> okay, it. But the other drop it. they do, it's, which is interesting, is it's only July, Fox. Sarah. Like, I, that's what I'm saying, though. And this is the reason why I get nervous that all these brands are like, we don't want to start prepping. I'm like, you need to prep six months ahead of time. Yeah. Because you need to start getting people in the mood of thinking about what's coming up instead of waiting until two weeks before it launches. So Black Friday for me usually starts end of July, early August. Somewhere in there, and we start prepping for it with all my clients just because I'm like, we have to start basically putting out these hints of what's coming, what's going to be. Now, 
once you get big enough brand level, like Starbucks, you don't have to do any sort of like preemptive, right? Like landing stuff because they People know are when banging down the doors. Lot, it's coming out, right? Uh, but at this level, when you're like a smaller brand, it's very, very important that you start like reminding people that stuff is coming. Super great yeah. important. Well, and I think too, what's also interesting about a lot of these is um, they build on, especially like uh, the pumpkin spice latte is it's built on a natural uh, yeah. seasonal change, right? Where it's like, oh, this is this is almost like the moniker of like, oh, it's Halloween time, it's fall. I get my pumpkin spice latte, and it, you build on these kind of um, built-in calendar triggers that you can then layer on. So there's there's not a ton of uh, that you you. So there's a, a great guy uh, called BJ Fogg. He has this incredible model called the Fog um, or Fog Behavior Change Model. And essentially, for behavior change to happen, you have to have three things. You have to have the prompt, the motivation, and the ability. And all those things have to happen simultaneously. And I think a lot of these brands do that really, really well. Um, I want to ask you about, so Robert Cialdini is one of my absolute muses, Super G, for people that haven't read Influence. Actually, he has a new book, or uh, a reiteration of Influence, fantastic book. But in there, there's uh, six principles in the first one, and then he added a seventh one. But there's scarcity, authority, social proof, sympathy, reciprocity, consistency, consistency, and then in the, uh, his recent iteration, he added unity. How do you think of those for a brand or is that a good starting point or is that too high level? Like, w- What are your thoughts on influence or things of that nature? Because I've, I've found that as an incredible, uh, great base level understanding for um, psychological levers in terms of pretty much anything. Yeah. I love Sildini. I think he did a fantastic job of kind of distilling down some of the basic human things that we experience yeah. when it comes to mo- like motivation, especially when it comes to purchases or acquiring resources, really, is what humans are constantly trying to do. Yeah. Um, or status. The tough part of, yeah, or status. And you could, ar- wow, you could argue huge. status is a resource, but yeah, I'm trying Yeah, to. I mean, a lot of people use it as a resource, that's for sure. Um, I find it really interesting, though, because I, I spent a lot of time studying all of this stuff. So I, I have a deep, deep knowledge of psychology, consumer behavior, those type of things. I find it very difficult to teach. Uh, and so Cialdini is fantastic. But the, the issue that I think most people have once they read them is great information and then they immediately forget it because it's it's heavy. It's a deep, deep dive into these really interesting concepts that are very complex with lots of pieces to unity. There's a whole lot of pieces to reciprocity or social proof it's not just putting a testimonial on an ad. That's not what social proof is. So I that he's not usually my go-to when I tell Ooh, people like here's what to I read. I like it's it. Not, who's who's he's the probably go-to like number then? five. <laughs> oh wow. Um, this, right is the, now? this is the two oh one or three oh one course, not the one oh one. Exactly. Well again, it, it depends on how much knowledge you have about psychology. So if you've been studying this for a while and you're just like, I need something deeper, he's fantastic. Like absolutely hundred percent. His book is like top five for me. Uh, the number one book I have right now is Marketing to Mind States. I talk about this one a ton by Will Leach, uh, mostly because he breaks it down to the specific emotion. And I think we got to start with emotion first and then work into what emotion actually builds, right? So there's a lot of emotion behind reciprocity. That has to do with giving a little bit, right? So we're trying really hard to make sure that we're loving into the people that we want to be associated with, but it also has to do with what we want back. So usually reciprocity, once you give someone something, you expect that to be returned in value. So I'm not going to give Ash a car and expect him to give me a gift card to McDonald's. <laughs> I'd be like, wow, that's what okay. A wow. I move. thought we were better friends. What you know a what I'm saying? Like, I'd be a little... <laughs> um, so reciprocity is like, really important. It's really important for brains. Oftentimes we give something to people and we expect a crap ton in return, right? It needs to be balanced, reciprocity value. So I like marketing mind state because it, it, it dives deeper into all of these specific emotions that we feel when we purchase things. And then you can use those emotions to build on these like more complex neurological concepts. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think the other thing that a few things going on there, one I think D to C is one of the most nuanced like categories ever where like yeah. it, it's really hard to have a best practices. Like when you get into these yep. big behemoths, 
that it's kind of like rich people, like rich people are the most homogeneous, boring people ever. They buy the same brands. They, you know, take private flights. They go to the same places. Whereas like the middle class is actually way more fun because there, there's just a smorgasbord of consumption. Like it's not, you're not Montclair, Hermes, like, you know what I'm saying? And so I think that's one of the challenges with D2C is everybody tries to overlay templates on D2C, but it, that's that was my always where my bull case or excuse me bear case for like Thrasios or um, what's uh, Keith Ripper Boys Open Store where it's like you're not going to get synergies because all these businesses like they look like the same but they're so nuanced and so contextual that you're yeah. not going to get the synergies quote unquote again I'm using all these gross words but that you would expect when you have a roll up, right? Where it's like, if I roll up a bunch of 3PLs, yeah, that makes sense because now all these 3PLs essentially do the same thing where it's like, just because I'm a D2C store, there's so much nuance there. And the the point I'm driving towards is what you said about the Robert stuff is that I think honestly, a lot of these aren't, they're not necessarily bad on their own, but when you start to blend them, for example, reciprocity with unity, with social proof, things get yeah. really interesting, right? Where it's like, oh, I put a little uh, golden ticket in your card where it's like, hey, you can get a free thing or hey, you get access to the limited drop because you bought this. It's it's like that surprise and delight, but then yeah. it's also artificial scarcity. And it's this blending of all these things. So I, I really take your point on that of it might be more of a advanced subject because just learning these seven pillars of quote unquote, you know, behavioral mindsets, it, it's hard because a lot of times it's a blend of all of them. It's not just reciprocity. Like sales is very reciprocity driven, right? Like, yeah. oh, hey, let me give you something and you're going to give me something back. Or, hey, th- there was the uh, people that, what was it? Um, uh, I, I forget, like the uh, Buddhist or somebody that would sit outside the subway with the roses and then they would give somebody a rose and then they wouldn't ask for anything. And then like, oh, man, now I got it. You know, yes. I, I got to give you something. Here's a few bucks or something to go help your temple or whatever you're trying to do. And then they would and like round the corner, drop the rose in the trash or whatever. And then they would just go grab that rose and do that. And, and so that's a perfect example of reciprocity. But I just think that there's a lot of complexity and nuance to D to C that yeah. isn't acknowledged a lot. And I think that's one thing that can be um, it definitely learn the basics, but a lot of times the the mastery is in the blending of a lot yeah. of these principles. Yeah. Well, humans are complex. I, I think we often forget that like we're dealing with humans here. It's not like we're dealing with computers. It's very different if it's ones and zeros. Here, we're dealing with humans who have massive amounts of all kinds of different experiences and relationships they've been in and associations that their brains have made. And this is why I love kind of what Ash has done with Avi, because they've taken an industry that was basically just Here's a problem we solve. Here's 50 different like visual brands that you could pick from. But they're all kind of the same, right? It's just the same exact thing. They took it and said, obviously, your need for collagen is complex, but also like your desire for something that you have to take every day is also complex. So let's make it fun. Let's add flavors. Let's add colors. Let's add all kinds of different things. And Ash, I want you to obviously put your uh, two words in here because you're the man running the ship, but... Um, I honestly think of it as a different where I think brand is actually more important and impactful in commoditized spaces. Because if you have product differentiation, it doesn't matter. Like your your product's just arguably better. Who cares? I don't care if the brand is great or not. Like give me the best product. Where when you have a commoditized space, you need to have that brand differentiation. I think what Avi did was they made this community, they made this going back to your emotional state, they made this thing that I want to f- with like, oh my gosh, like I'm part of the Avi community, blah, blah, blah. And then the byproduct is, oh yeah, I take collagen or oh yeah, I take the the sex thing or oh yeah, I take the fertility thing or like the it didn't start. I, I know from the business, from the ground up, it started at like, what product can we build? But from the whole marketing experience, the product was never the show. The, the show was how can I make these people feel like they're emotionally connected to the brand they're doing right by themselves. They're making themselves a better life. Like what are the emotional strings I can pull on to make them feel like they're a part of something bigger that is going to make their life better so they can tell their significant other or their kids that, hey, I can go play with you now or, hey, I look better now in the mirror or things of that nature. And then just the monetization mechanism happened to be collagen or what have you. And that, I, so I, I kind of take your point, but I see it uh, on the flip where it, it, it was Instead of almost like a bottoms up business, it was a top down where it's like, how can I create this incredible experience and community and emotional charge 
that I can then monetize through these different vectors. And That's so, on knowing uh, your customer. <laughs> Ash is yeah, real yeah. good at this one. <laughs> yeah, I, I I think just to just add to two cents here. Um, what are exactly exactly as you guys are saying? It's it's a commodity, right? I can literally go to Amazon, pick up a, a bottle of proteins for fourteen ninety nine. I can go to CVS and pick up something, whatever, right? Why would anybody come in and buy this for forty bucks? Okay, at the end of the day, when you're when we're marketing, right? The the number there was two things I really wanted to happen, which was the second a comment comes in on an ad, we respond to it, right? And we have a community that we can push and funnel people in to make sure when they do get our product, they have success with it, right? Nobody else, I, I'm sure there's other brands that have, but like the majority of them do not have this, right? They don't have this emotional connection. They don't have uh, a connection with other people who are going through this that they can relate to, right? So one of the biggest things that we're doing now is, I guess, try to try to answer the question of why should I use this? Has anybody else found success with that? Those are the two biggest questions that any supplement brand will have, right? Yep. And a lot of people, like even when you launch a new ad, like there's there's annoying people who are like, oh, there's no comments on this. Like that means nobody uses it. Like lady, I just launched the ad, right? So like <laughs> yeah. that's where, that's just where I have to team. like, <laughs> yeah, like you have no idea what I went through. Like <laughs> I'm running a CBO, running this. Like, you have no idea, lady. You don't understand the uh, pain I went through to make this out. <laughs> That's hilarious. And so to really nail that, like, yeah, the landing page can have testimonials. Again, like consumers are like, ah, whatever, this could be fake, whatever, right? Can I, like, link them to a person's post in the community that, like, explain the whole problem that they went to and then the solution that they found? And like within that, that will have a ton of social proof, right? So literally any answer that or any question that we get now, like, oh, like how, do, what's the best way to take this? I'll link to a post in the community of like somebody's daily regimen, yeah, right? That's brilliant. It's, it's adding that layer of, oh, okay, there's actually people behind this that are using it. Oh, there's 70,000 people in here. Okay. This has to be somewhat legitimate. Oh, I can come in here and talk to people. All right. Then let me give, let me spend the extra $20 to get this. And be a part of this versus let me go to Walmart and pick up Vital for fifteen bucks. Yeah, so you're you're making it also a very re good connection between. I'm going to send you a post from somebody who's already had this experience, in, in lieu of sending you to like a blog post where we curated all of the information that you're going to need. Hundred like percent. It's, it's so different of an experience because you just brands aren't trusted nearly as much as they used to be. Um, we're coming out of the brand era, honestly, and kind of into the AI marketing area. So it's like it's, it's a very different time to be a D2C brand. Perhaps to Ash for like make it happen. But yes, that that offering this kind of like you don't have to trust us if you don't want to, but you can trust our customers because they've been through it. So huge. So big. And let me just go through again the, the, the pillars. You hit on authority there. You hit on social proof. You hit on sympathy, you hit on reciprocity, and you hit on unity. It's five out of the seven. And what that community also generates is consistency, right? Like I can consistently put in a question there and get an answer. Like, like, and it's not to also to Sarah's point, it's not tainted by coming from some brand representative. Like, it's one thing to ask a brand a question, but like that was one of the biggest things when um, to kind of pivot a little bit into SaaS, like. Paid ads are a, they're, they're a joke for SaaS. Like nobody, unless you're in like a 49, like a four play or something where it's like an impulse purchase and like who cares, a $40, $50, $100 a month product. Like nobody buys proper SaaS from ads. Everybody buys proper SaaS from text messages, from dinners, from like talking. Oh, Ash, what are you guys using? Oh, that's what you're using. That's cool. You like it? That's how people buy SaaS products. And so I think that um, that's kind of one of the interesting parallels that we ran into where there, there couldn't be... Um, everything kind of going back to the end of the brand era, almost SaaS was like in front of D to C, whereas like canary in the coal mine, because nothing coming from the brand would be trusted because it was always wrapped into how are you trying to get me to sign up? Oh, you want my MQL, SQL, blah, blah, blah. And there was always this um, shield up. And when you have that shield up, you're never going to be emotional. You're always going to be rational. But once you can break into the emotional aspect of it, and there is a great book um, by Professor Galloway, um, where he basically talks about um, how the lower you go, so you have your brain, your heart, your stomach, and your genitals, the lower you go, the bigger the margins are because those margins are rooted in emotion and not rationale. 
and they're rooted not only in um, emotion, but they're rooted in basically non-consumption. They're rooted in some other intrinsic motivator versus utilitarianism, where I'm just consuming the thing to be the thing. And so you can ask people for a lot more money, like a Birkin bag, $60,000. A $5,000 coach bag is no less than a $60,000 Birkin bag in terms of the materials, the quality, et cetera. Why are you buying the Birkin bag for the experience, for the status, for the, the, the ability to show that I am, you know, for all intents and purposes, better than all these other people. Like I am not, that was one of the biggest things that I found so fascinating that uh, Louis Vuitton and all these luxury people get really angry about counterfeits. It's not because you're, you're taking market share. What you're doing is you're actually deteriorating the market share because I don't want to be associated. And again, this sounds elitist. I'm not talking from me personally. I'm just, this is how luxury brands think. I don't want to be associated with that person. I want to be associated with this person. And if you see some rando on the street carrying a Louis V bag, guess what I'm not getting? I'm not getting that Louis V bag. And that's why, like, again, the Birkin bag has no Hermes branding, basically. And so anyways, that was kind of my just little diatribe on. I, I'm just super fascinated with luxury because it's, luxury is like the most incredible there's um, some serious psychology in luxury. It's the it, anti-marketing it marketing. Intense. It's I love the anti-marketing I, I marketing. I love luxury because it's a very, very difficult market to break into. But once you're in there, you can last for literally centuries. So this is it. So that's so the, going back to the Barbie thing. So, bar, so there's a bifurcation between premium and luxury. But luxury, um, the challenge there is exactly what you said, Sarah, because the luxury is almost generational. Like, like yep. it has to be. It has to be changed. like Louis V was literally started as a case maker. Hermes made saddles like these are absolutely old, iconic brands. And it's crazy. Yeah. Anyways, I won't go down all those crazy pathways, but luxury, I could go on and on and on. It's my it's my marketing guys, muse. If you want, I, I'm going to like overtake. Flip a little the bit. script. <laughs> Why do you think customers have such a big distrust in brands up front? Like the very first, I don't trust the brand because this seems to be like, um, I, I mean, I have my own theories, but like. It seems to be massive, market-wide, any industry, any vertical. It's like, immediately, I don't trust the brand, but I will trust the customers of the brand. I want to know what you guys think about this, because I've been thinking about it for a while. Uh, I'll jump first, Ash, just yeah, give you some more time to think. But for me, it's, again, going back to the emotional, I don't think you care about me, you just want my money. But if you give me stuff, if you, you give me stuff with that- experience space? Like, they've just it's experienced a, it's, enough bad well, I think brand. Brands? I think brand is- an aggregation of all the brand touch points. So yep. if the only experience I've had with the brand is asks, why yeah. would I trust you? Like you're sending me ads to buy, you're doing this to do this, you're doing, yeah. you've given me no value and you, all you're doing is asking me, asking me, asking me, asking me. You didn't even take me on a date. You didn't even send me a love letter. You just want to go <laughs> to bed. Like that's crazy. And okay, again, I'm there's <laughs> some brands that you can do that with because the brand doesn't really matter. It's a product. And you True. want that product, yeah. but you've already done your research on that product. So you've already kind of self, you know, uh, educated yourself where you're like, OK, cool, I want this. But brands like prospecting in general, like there there has to be on ramps to. Uh, and again, going back because triples the, the closest experience we've had or it's just uh, most recent is that that was one of the things we didn't do well at the beginning was there was no real on ramps for it, like if you were coming to the website it was basically buy. Like yeah. we, we, so it was like, oh, you know what? We need a newsletter. We need a podcast. We need to start throwing events. We, we don't care if you give us any money. All we care about is, are we making your life better? How can we generate value for you? And so now I'm not an as salesperson, I'm a friend. And then, oh, if you do want to give me some money, here's how you can give me money. And so that's my kind of uh, rant on brands where brands just want to give, 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 or take, 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 take right at the beginning. And, and that's just a terrible way, in my opinion, to start a relationship. And so th this is going to sound horrible, but that's why I think like brand awareness and non-performance spend is actually really interesting. The challenge there is the economics get really, really hairy yeah. if you don't have a big LTV product or if you... So th I'm not saying brands are wrong to try and make sure their economics work out. I'm just saying that that is where my angst and uh, non-trust comes or that's where it's generated from interesting what about you Ash? i love that well i mean from the SaaS perspective i totally agree with your premise of like how do i give right which is why a lot of these dinners are like super popular now like how can i how can i get you dinner drinks and then at least maybe talk about the the platform so totally be there, <laughs> right 
when it comes to and I want sympathy to talk about as this, well. Sure. Yeah. Fair. Yeah. Fair. I learned. I'm going to talk about this from like a prospecting, like on a meta situation where like you see an ad again. I'm not in any mood to buy something. I'm just on social. I'm looking at news. I'm looking at whatever. I'm here to be entertained. If I'm not in the mood and I'm seeing this product that like, okay, cool. Maybe I do want it. I want to actually experience the brand in my own time. And I think the best way to do that would be like, at least for obvious, like, all right, let me check out that community. Let me, let me see what people are talking about and then decide, can I go in and really explore this brand? Right. Cause you're going to see hundreds of ads a day. Which one is really worth my time going into? I think that's where, to your point, Sarah, I want to see the customers really like yeah. talking about it and really like boasting about it because then I only have a certain amount of budget to allocate towards whether it's frivolous spend or or spend that I need stuff you know stuff that I need. Um, can I make sure that in the shortest amount of time I am making the best decision? And I think yeah. that's going right. to be through the social proof and, and and speaking to customers and and really listening to those stories. Oh, you touched on something so near and dear to my heart. I'm an absolute, and I, I don't like to use the term believer because it's dogmatic, but I'm an absolute believer and I will die on the hill that people buy with the no regret strategy where they would rather not make a decision than make a bad decision. And so until you can get them, again, once they become vulnerable, emotional, then you can get to a place of making a decision that they're not going to necessarily regret. But until that, once I'm doing, if I'm still doing value calculations in my head, you've already lost. And I don't want to make the decision because I don't want to tell my wife, my partner, or my significant other why I bought this stupid thigh trimmer that I'm never going (laughs) to use because I spent $100 and now it's just sitting under the bed. Like I'd much rather just not have that conversation then give you my money, even though it might actually be net net beneficial to me. I don't want to take that chance. I am very, very risk averse until you start warming me up through these um, other touch points like you're talking about, Ash, where they're, they're very vulnerable touch points. They can generate a lot of emotion. They can show me the dream that I can believe in. Um, until that point, I think it's really pointless to sell because it, it, or again, it depends, all this is nuanced. It depends on why you're trying to consume. But if you're trying to going back to that that brand affinity, if you're not making my life better and you're not showing me like muses or reasons why I should be in your brand, I mean, that's so why I thought Nike was so incredible. What did Nike do at the very beginning? Like Shoot Dogs, one of the most incredible books ever. He partnered with all the best athletes. Like, dude, I'm yeah. I'm not even gonna run ads. I just want you see that guy that Prefontaine that just won X, Y, or Z medal. <laughs> Guess what he was wearing? I mean, I don't know if you guys remember, but the Tiger Woods golf shot. Where that like ball rolls and because he, he was using Nike and it like it was it, you can't even make that up like it was like a, a advertiser right where the ball literally stays there for like half a second the Nike logo is perfectly displayed and then it drops in in the Masters like come on and so I think that without giving people that again looking forward to or things of that nature it starts to become a transactional relationship. And in a transactional relationship, you go to Amazon, you go to Costco, you go to wherever the slowest, you, you, it's just a different value calculation. You're talking about logistics. You're talking like, how many brands like will you buy from that it takes like five days or seven days to get it? But that's the only place you can get it from. And again, that's another pillar of luxury. If you control your distribution, yeah. you control your brand. I think that's why also like influencer marketing does like very well when done correctly is that yes. you're not, you don't feel like you're being sold to. It's somebody that I respect and I follow is telling me how something helped their day. Again, this has to be the most genuine thing like ever. Like it's not like, oh, hey guys, like whatever, right? It needs to be authentic. I'm obsessed, right? Like on TikTok, when you, when you see those viral videos and you like, as a marketer, you know, that wasn't paid for the, the authentic like reaction about them talking about something that actually would prompt me to go and buy right away versus seeing that exact thing from the brand um even though it's the same product even though it's just, it does the same thing it's just presented in a way that's like so much more authentic so i think there's there's something to be said about influence why influencer marketing works so well and that's probably the reason why not couldn't agree with you more brilliant Gosh, Sarah, brilliant. you need to, you need to host more with us you're you're, you're pulling out all <laughs> the goodies i would love to i would love yeah, to have you're pulling a out all the goodies <laughs> 
I love this it. This is the type of stuff uh, that they don't talk it up about, I think, so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, again, the challenge, a lot of it is everybody wants like a playbook or a template and things. And it's just, again, D to C is not that. Like yeah. if you if you want to start a drop shipping brand or whatever, yeah, whatever. You can do these things that are, you're just essentially trying to drive consumerism. But if you're really trying to make emotional connections and help people in ways that are unique to your brand, one, it's hard. Two, it's expensive. And three, it's scary because you have to figure out ways to monetize, right? Like you just, it's, this is a business, not a charity. And so there there has to be some end game of like, I can't just run brand awareness the whole time and then not have any impact on revenue. Like if brand awareness is working and I see the impact on revenue, that's fantastic. But just because people love me doesn't necessarily mean they're going to give me money. And that, that, that I think is the big yeah. rub. And like anything, you can go too far in either direction, right? Like, oh, we don't ever need to ask for money because people love us. And then you go out of business or you, you know, you become just, just cutthroat of like, oh, I got to get more money, more money, more money. And so like all things, it's gray, not black and white. Tweet that. Tweet that. Oh, Tweet. That was amazing. Look at that. I know. I need my KFC moment. Ash has had it. <laughs> you've had it. I'm over here slumming around in the tens of thousands. Unbelievable. Unbelievable I am. Um, what else you want? Is there any, maybe we'll wrap up on, is there any uh, brands that are really doing psycho, psychological ads, right? Like, are I there any brands? I do have one question. Oh, you got one more? I got, I got one question, right? So I think a lot of people have been talking about, like, summer's always like a really slow time for people um, that they should be focusing on Q4, whatever it is. And there are brands that need to survive during the summer too, right? So when you've had, I guess, a phenomenon of one you have like Father's Day, so Father's Day sales. Then you had July 4th, two weeks later. And then you had Prime Day sales, two weeks later, right? How do you go about also have some spill tea about the Prime. Mar- Prime Day. How do you go about like adjusting marketing so that one, you're still staying relevant through the slower time, but then like without devaluing yourself where you're like constantly going through sales, you yeah. know? yeah. Uh, and this is a really interesting question because this this is something that I think Amazon struggled with heavily in the beginning because they just kept hitting holiday sales, Christmas, Fourth of July, Halloween, like, you know, Mother's Day, those type of things. As soon as those holidays end, you see sales drop, it becomes dead zone time, right? And um, summer is notorious for dead zone time unless you have a summer-based product, mostly because people are outside. The behavior has changed, right? Humans or are traveling, doing yeah. things. Traveling, like doing doing things other than shopping, <laughs> Even though they bring their technology with them now, like they still have their phones and they're still on social media, but they're not purchasing as much because they're not thinking about it anymore, right? Once you get inside and it's colder and you're just like, you're cuddled up all the time, all you want to do is shop because it's a good dopamine hit, right? So what Amazon did was they made their own holiday with Prime. They were freaking brilliant (laughs) with it. They made their own holiday and they're going to continue to do this it's not just going to be prime days they have random days all over the place per little tiny industries where they're like we're going to run sales on this 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 if you're a brand that doesn't have billions of different product types it's a little bit more difficult but you can come up with your own holidays at any point in time and just say this is obby day and on obby day always on august 1st from now on for the next 50 years or however long we're in business we are now just going to do some sort of promotion. It doesn't have to be a discount, but we're going to give away free gifts with every single purchase. We're going to give away a free chat with Ash with every single purchase, like whatever it is, right? You don't have to give away a lot. You can do all kinds of different things for your promotion, whatever offer fits best for your margin. But I I think brands are too hesitant to, to morph outside of the culture. You get to create whatever you want in this industry because it's a D to C. Like you can make your own holidays if you want. If you have any brand that you market to women, back to school can be used at any point in time. As soon as you hit July, back to school needs to be started to prep because like all of these women are starting to think about purchasing now because we got kids and like we're getting into purchasing mode. So don't think that after 4th of July is dead zone all the way till Black Friday. That's a horrible way to prep. You got all kinds of back to school stuff. You can create your own holidays. As soon as we get into September, October, we should start fall prep. Because especially yeah. in this particular country, that's big for women between the ages of 25 and 45. So understanding the culture, I think, helps a lot. Understanding your customers is going to help even more. But then also not being afraid to just make it your own. If you have a dead zone, make a holiday. 
Yeah. And I would take that even a step further. Like for you guys, Ash, you could make a month of it and yeah. say, Hey, you know what? We hired a virtual, we, yeah, we hired yeah, a virtual hi personal trainer and you guys can join yeah, X, Y, and Z and wow. create value on this. And okay, every, we're going to do this. Oh, exactly. We're going to have a cohort of everybody. Hey, we know you have your summer goals to do this way. So I would think of it not in terms of monetization, but in terms of brand engagement, because yeah. a lot of people just aren't shopping. But you know what? Once I'm done traveling or like, hey, you can do this or hey, you know, we're going to do a, a, a wines from around the world because we know you and we're going to get a small EA on and blah, blah, blah. You have a fixed cost to do this. You get a ton of brand engagement. And then at worst, you're filling up your retargeting pools for the real money months when people are ready to spend. Yeah. And so I, I think you, yeah. you do need to be cognizant of the economics, but there's way easier ways to create these layers of brand engagement that not necessarily drive revenue, but they drive value for the person. And then when that person's ready to consume, like, oh, by the way, if you want to keep up your summer pump or whatever, here's a really good obvi stack for you to go into the fall or things of that nature. And so th I, I would take it a, a, a step further and figure out ways that you can build on periphery. Like another cool thing that you guys could do is like, oh, by the way, if you buy X amount, hey, we created these cool travel packs because we know you guys travel during the summer. So instead of having to lug this huge yeah. obby container, here's a $5 upseller. Oh, you're part of our membership? Our member, Why don't you join our summer membership and you get the travel calendar, you get access to the yoga classes, you get access to all this, and you can do it in such a way that you're creating value for the consumer. Yeah. And it feels like a one-to-one, -one, but it's really a one-to-many. And so I think that, or that's how I would approach it in the dead seasons, because you're absolutely right. You, you're going to either want to drop products or things of that nature, but even product drops don't really work out because to Sarah's point, like the zeitgeist isn't ready to consume. Like I'm ready to go outside. I'm ready to travel. I'm ready to like, this is my time. How can you make my time better? But I can keep Avi at, in the in the decision purchase or I can keep Avi near and dear to my heart because they help me out through this yeah. time. Yeah. And go, I mean, really just go with the behavior that's already there. This is the, if you take nothing else Bingo. from this entire podcast, please work with the behavior that's already there. Don't try and change behavior because that's the hardest thing you could possibly focus on as a DDC brand. Work with the behavior that's already there. So even even bigger, if you wanted to take Avi to like ridiculous level, which would I don't even know if you want to go there, Ash. Start your own Avi TV that has shifts by season, right? That you can continuously produce content for these women that they can consume themselves outside of the product itself. And you have so many. I mean, you just have so many testimonials. You could push that on there. You could hire somebody to do yoga classes. It could just be. It's now August. We need to start prepping for what's coming up. Like, here's what we're going to change on the Avi channel thing, and just make it a part of the year. Yeah. Yep. Totally agree. Totally agree. Get that it. Free game. That free <laughs> game. Uh, okay. What else do we want to talk about? We're kind of pushing up over an hour, so I want to be cognizant of everybody's time. Is there anything else, Ash, that you wanted to uh, throw against the wall of awesomeness that is Sarah Levenger? I just had that question, and I'm, I'm satisfied question. now. Get it? It's a great. Get it was it. a great question. I think I'm gonna wait for one it. of the. That's the. I think one of the biggest challenges is smoothing the revenue curve, um, for D 2 C. And so again, I think for me to take kind of like a Sarah Levengerism, I would start in that smoothing the revenue curve of, um, how do I generate value for my users, not how do I make more sales. There's time to make more sales. I'm not saying that Q4, Q1 make people give you a bunch of money. Q2 can be uh, just a challenge. Like, and to Sarah's point, like going against people's not only um, societal stuff, but just the inherent things, it's, 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 a, it's a game you don't want to play. But if you can piggyback on this stuff and then build, 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 build like a hibernating bear, and then when you kind of come out of that cave, it's just going to be row ass for days. As for days. Yeah, let's that, go. I, it all comes down to that behavior one. And if you don't know the behavior, find someone who, do, who does. And then, t I mean, like, go to Rava. And then have Rava just create a plan for you like he just did. Because that, that was the other thing I was going to touch on that you, you really said, and we'll wrap up on this, is that one of the really cool ways to do that is behavior stack, right? Yeah. So, like, we were uh, back in the day, I was working with a company that... Um, we wanted to do um, sleeping pills and so like, not like bad sleeping pills, like melatonin and stuff. And so one of the things that we did was like, Hey, what do people usually do at night? You usually brush your teeth at night, unless you're some kind of psychopath savage. I actually went through a hippy dippy phase where I didn't brush my teeth for like a year. Cause I thought all that it was 
don't try that Blah, at home, kids. Blah. It was horrible. Not the path. Not the path. Anywho, yeah. I just I I was like but our did ancestors. You, like, I got I was like horrible? super into it was what? it was terrible. I was got really into ancestral health and like it was not that's not the what path. Was your dentist Modern like? dentistry is amazing. You use toothpaste, brush your teeth. But the point there was um, once we started to stack on those behavior triggers, going back to the behavior model of having that prompt. So you have the ability, you have the motivation, you have the prompt because the prompt was like, OK, I just brush my teeth. Now what do I do? Oh, I take my melatonin tablet. And so that's another um, nice behavior hack if you're trying to get into um, if you have a, a cyclical consumable. Yeah. Um, OK. We're five minutes over the hour. <laughs> Sarah, how can people work with you? Where are you? Are you on the mentor pass? Drop all this yeah, time is yours. Plug everything. Yes, yes. I am on MentorPass. Please go find me over there. Um, Obviously, they'll drop all my links. But I'm also on Twitter constantly. I am still over there posting. Trying Twitter to keep queen. up my record. I've dropped my posting a little bit just because I'm like, I can't post four times a day anymore. So we're tired. So I've switched to long form posts, which seem to be doing better. I mean, just, you know, view wise uh, overall. I'm also on LinkedIn. I'm trying to get my YouTube back up because I've got these like all these really cool ideas for like I tried to make a thousand dollars off of a one dollar ad. I'm gonna give a brand to the consumers for a day and see what they do with it. I'm gonna like interview all these consumers and see what they think about Avi on the street. Like I just have ideas and I wanna do them and I need help is what oh, I let's need. Let's collab. Anyways. Let's let's yeah, sync offline because I'm trying help. to I'm trying to hit the YouTubes as well. I'm really I'm if I could build any audience, it would be on YouTube. YouTube, not TikTok, Darryl, not Twitter, like, not LinkedIn. Yeah. Like I think those are the most most valuable users, and you can do long form, you can do education, Overlink. you can do fun. Well, I'll connect with you offline. <laughs> uh, Mentor Pass, are you, are you still the newsletter or no? You use newsletter. I you do, do have newsletter. Newsy? Yes, okay. I finally started one. I should have done it two years ago. I'm just dumb. It's the problem. Um, How do people sign so, up? Yeah. Uh, it's in my bio. If you go to Twitter, okay. um, yeah, I'll we'll drop all the... It's just in my bio. So beautiful. We'll drop all right. the links. Okay. Um, are we are we still doing vitamin shop or have we switched to Wally World? Still vitamin? Three weeks. Three uh, more weeks. Okay. Tired so and all. Three more weeks. So <laughs> I'm on the European Vision Quest on the bullet train in Morocco and I look over and I see a vitamin shop. I pull the lever and I, I stop the train. And then what do I do, Ash? I mean, if you don't get arrested, you should <laughs> probably, probably head... <laughs> to that vitamin shop that you ruined everybody's days over and you pick up every single bottle that was there because you have to make it worth it. And then you come oh back, God. you tweet at me, you send me a picture and all is good in the world. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and then you head it. back to oh America. <laughs> and, then, and then you do the same thing, man. You get out of the <laughs> you airport. You do the same thing. <laughs> yeah. oh, I love that. That's sick. Um, Milwani, you're on the Mentor Pass. Where else? Yep, find me on Twitter at Ashra Milwani. Um, chew on this. Oh, our yeah, newsletter. your new season. Yeah, new, new season. season. Yep, yep. Uh, I've been new season just them. dropped. They're so good. They're so good. Production quality is yeah. insane. Yeah. Yep. The the guests, we have a ton of guests this season. Um, some really cool people. Uh, so definitely check it out. Uh, we have a newsletter. We send out two every week, one on Wednesday, just something to chew on during your lunch break. And then Sunday see? to you see fully, what he did there, folks? Uh, dive into um mentor pass um you can find me there and then um coming soon ron and i are starting a chew on this dinner series so oh, have dinner with us yeah hosting some me. dinners in the city Heck me. So if you are in new york new jersey close to the city uh dm me we'll send you a link to some of the events that we're throwing um but yeah amazing amazing uh felt felt good to be back sarah you are incredible as always i'm, I'm serious hey, we're, we're gonna take over youtube together uh, if you want to get on the bestest newsletter ever, we have a newsletter that goes out every Tuesday, Thursday called Whale Mail. You can subscribe right at triplewell.com slash whale mail. Um, if you want to see our beautiful faces and Sarah's lovely hair what? and Milwani's fantastic feastables, uh, merch, you can go to our YouTube channel. That's just youtube.com slash triplewell. And then if you want to ride the lightning, you can go to triplewell.com, experience the magic. We actually, uh, in a couple of weeks, we're going to have um, the Founders Dash drop, which is going to be our first. Uh, so we're currently a Shopify app, but we're actually going to have a forever free plan where you can, um, if the economics don't make sense for you right now or what have you, um, you can get all the, tri well, not all the Triple Well magic, but enough to uh, experience the awesomeness. And then we have a bunch of cool updates. So go follow us on the Twitters, follow me on the Twitters, whatever you need to do. But we really appreciate you guys. Um, and then also uh, ping us, um, me, Ash, uh, or a Triple Well account and how we can make this podcast more valuable to you guys. 
we're here for you folks and uh, value leave a generation. Review. Leave a oh, review. Oh yeah, leave a review. Leave a review. Um, and we really appreciate any feedback, uh, good, bad, or indifferent. Any type of love is always appreciated. So thank you guys. Thank you so much, Sarah, for taking the time out. You're thank the best. You. Lovely, lovely. Love you, brother. We'll talk soon. All right, folks. We'll see you on the flip. That's it. Bye-bye.